What a perfect time of year to visit Fort Collins. This city embraces fall. It has the perfect scenery, the perfect breweries, the perfect music, and the perfect opponent coming to town. Boise State has never lost to Colorado State. It has been complete domination over an opponent that continues to grasp at something that just seems unattainable. Today, the Broncos will also look to stay perfect in Mountain West play and continue to remind the Rams what the perfect program in this conference really looks like. Bronco Roundup Game Day starts now. Now, a special presentation from the KTBB News Group. Bronco Roundup Game Day starts now. Good evening, everyone, and welcome live inside Canvas Stadium on the campus of Colorado State. Boise State taking on Colorado State, and I hope the wait was worth it because it is a late kickoff tonight. This game will not start before 7.55. We got the countdown to kick off going for you under 53 minutes until Boise State takes the field. You can see the specialist out on the field warming up at midfield. I'm your host, Jay Tusk. Brady Frederick's going to join us in just a second, but Boise State's going to look to continue to keep the good times rolling here in Fort Collins. They've never lost in this town, and they've never lost to the team they're going to take on tonight. A perfect 12-0 all-time against Colorado State. Coming up on this digital-only version of Bronco Roundup Game Day, we're going to look at the Australian influence uh, in this game. Both kickers have uh, kickers that, well, uh, are punters that kicked over in Australia. We're also going to look at the uh, keys of the game and so much more. But first, we welcome in Brady Frederick, who is standing by back in the KTV studios. Happy game day, Brady. Happy game day to you, Jay. Good to see you again. We had a lot of fun this morning. Glad to do it all once again. And this is going to be a fun matchup for Boise State. Not only do you have a streak on the line, 12-0 all time against the Colorado State Rams, but it could be a big momentum shift coming into the bye week. Boise State still has a lot going on with their two-quarterback offense, a defense that has finally shown maybe what they're capable of this season, and another chance to just remain consistent. That's been the entire story this season. Yeah, you're exactly right, Brady. And coming up a little bit later on, we're going to take a look at a couple of the playmakers from the game last week. Youngsters starting to show up and uh, show some more consistency. That's a playmaking ability. There's James Ferguson Reynolds right there. Today, he will carry out the hammer. And I am told he is the first kicker or punter in school history that has ever received the honor to carry out the Dan Paul hammer. That's pretty cool right there. Again, Brady Frederick is going to have a story on James Ferguson Reynolds coming up here in just a little bit. Let's go back to last night when the team arrived here in Fort Collins. Oh, blue, blue, blue. <laughs> I will have what he's having. Maybe the bus driver should deliver the pregame speech tonight. The guys got into Fort Collins right around 3.30 yesterday. Now, it has been a long day waiting around the hotel. These 8 p.m. kickoffs used to be the norm for this program, but ever since the switch in the television contract, this has kind of become a rarity. So the guys have had to really find a way to fill their time until kickoff at 8 o'clock this evening. Let's get you a look at the tail of the tape for tonight's matchup. Boise State gets back to 500 following last week's victory over San Jose State. They're at 3-3 three and three on the year. Meanwhile, Colorado State trying to climb back to 500 this season. Colorado State holds the advantage when it comes to scoring offense, averaging 31 points per game. But as you can see right here, Boise State holds the upper hand in just about every other category. That's yards gained on offense, yards prevented on defense, as well as uh, points prevented on defense. We'll see if Boise State can continue heading in the right direction, particularly on offense tonight. All right. Once again, we are joined by Brady Frederick back in the KTVB studios. As I mentioned earlier, Brady, Boise State, perfect on the season in Mountain West Conference play and perfect all time against the opponent they take on tonight. That's right, Jay, and you know, these streaks are really important. Last week, they held on to an important streak against San Jose State. They had never lost to them on the blue, thanks to a remarkable second-half comeback. That one stayed alive. We'll see if Boise State can keep their streak going, never losing a game to Colorado State. The Broncos are a perfect 12-0 against the Rams. Last year's meeting was a blowout out on the blue, 49-10, the second most points BSU has put up during the Andy Avalos era. Obviously, out in Fort Collins, there's some extra motivation to change that. Everybody wants to beat Boise 
Boise State. Talking with redshirt senior defensive lineman Mohamed Kamara back at Mountain West Media Days, he told me he thinks this is their year. It's weird to say that we've never beat them. Like, I, I, I didn't notice until people bring it up. You know, that's a part of the game. That's a part of football. It really is. Coach Novero has beaten Boise State at other places and stuff like that. So he always rants about that. So it's like, we're supposed to beat them. You know what I mean? And I don't know what it is. Maybe they had our number for the last 100 years or whatever. But, you know, hopefully we get to beat them this year, and we're going to probably do that. So, you know, respect to you guys. But, you know, we have things that we want to do. So Kamara is the big threat on the Rams' D-line. He leads the Mountain West with 10 sacks already on the year. And over the Rams are on offense, the defense for BSU, they're going to have to work to stop Torrey Horton, the brother of former Boise State standout Tyler Horton, one of the premier talents in the Mountain West Conference at wide receiver. He's picked up seven receiving touchdowns, 560 receiving yards. He also has a punt return touchdown, and he's thrown for a touchdown. BSU secondary certainly going to have their hands full tonight with a guy who can get it done in a lot of different ways. You talk about a young man that can really do it all receiver-wise. He's not one of those guys that they just put him one place. He'll be in the middle. He could catch slant routes across. They'll give him screen plays. You know, he does whatever he, whatever he wants to do um, on that football field. There's not a lot of people I've seen done that. Just how versatile he is and, and how it, um, sort of dynamic he can be. You know, like he's very hard to read, very hard to defend. Um, and the moment you think you've defended him, we've got three other amazing receivers yeah, he's just so aggressive and so dynamic in his game that he, he's very hard to shut down. Because not only is he a great route runner, he can be in the slot, make, make linebacker safeties miss, he could also just go, go get it on a deep ball too. So we're going to be very aware where 14 is at consistently. Today in, Col in Fort Collins, we are going to get a chance to see two of the most productive wide receivers in the Mountain West Conference. Sure, Torrey Horton entered this week leading the Mountain West in receptions, but Boise State sophomore wide receiver Eric McAllister ranks number one in both receiving yards and catches of 20 or more yards. As you can see here, Horton is more of the possession type receiver that leans on a volume of catches for his production. Meanwhile, Emac is known for his big play making ability. Had a big 44 yard catch to set up a touchdown last week. We'll see if he can continue to keep the good times rolling this week in here uh, in Fort Collins. Um, Brady, really quick, what I was going to say is I actually texted uh, Tyler Horton, the brother of Tory Horton, earlier this week. He said that he will be cheering for his brother, but Bronco Nation should know that he bleeds blue. So uh, maybe the perfect case scenario, a Boise State win, and Tory ends up with like 15 catches or something like that. From the guys that catch the rock, though, to the guys that throw it, a big storyline around Boise State right now, Brady, is the dual quarterback setup. Are they going to use it again this week? Because it seem, certainly seems like they will. Yeah, they are going to again, Jay. And it's going to be interesting because last week we really didn't know what it was going to look like. And I think the thing that surprised the most people is how much they really split it up. I mean, in between drives, they would shuffle between Taylor Green and Maddox Madsen. But the two quarterbacks really are able to get it done. And after the success they found last week, they're ready to keep growing in that unique offensive system. It's, despite the fact that they compete with each other for more opportunities out on the field, the underclassmen QBs have not lost sight of the most important thing, helping their team win whatever it takes. When we talked with Green and Madsen after Tuesday morning's practice, they both have embraced the opportunity to push each other to be better, and they even have come up with a special celebration they do when one of them scores a touchdown. I know he's definitely one of the bigger leaders on our team, and he's shown that by this reaction. I, I mean, I love it. Like, his support for me and my, my support for him, it's one of those things that just rubs off on each other, and I think the whole team's starting to see that as we came together in that second half. I've never really experienced, like, switching out of games like that, but working together, it's something that, like, our relationship has definitely come to, being fun with each other like that. Just bringing that energy, you know, when, when Maddox scores and stuff, uh, we, we now have like a handshake, just jumping and everything. So it definitely gives an opportunity, you know, f to just make the most of every single opportunity. But at the same time, like when you're not in, being that leader, just being that energy giver, you know, um, Av talks about, you know, setting the temperature, not being like too like quiet. That's definitely, um, it's definitely a great opportunity to, to do that. And I'm uh, definitely, you know, grateful, you know, just doing whatever, wherever it takes to get the, get the win at the end of the day.
And so the coaching staff really impressed with these two guys because of the character it has taken to make this thing work. Specifically, we talked with Bush Hamden, the offensive coordinator this week at the Coach's Weekly Press Conference. He's a guy who knows what it's like to lose your role at Boise State. He lost the starting quarterback job to Kellen Moore. He was extremely impressed with the response that he saw from Taylor Green, taking this as a time where he can use this opportunity to push himself to be better and push the team to be better as well, Jay. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. I thought that was an awesome statement by Bush Hamden talking about how he's relating to Taylor Green right now because 20 years ago, he was basically in Taylor's shoes, battling to keep his job. Taylor Green still is the future, but they have to figure out the present. And right now, number four, Maddox Mad Madsen is part of the present. You know, one thing that I thought was kind of interesting about this whole setup is the lack of a senior leader in the quarterback room. When you look back over time, Brett Rippon had Ryan Finley. Kellen Moore had Bush Hamden. Grant Hedrick had Kellen Moore. There has always been that veteran leadership influence in the locker room. And right now, there are no upperclassmen. It is Taylor Green, who is the oldest guy, and he is a redshirt sophomore. But I thought that it was an interesting topic. So earlier this week, I caught up with Boise State legendary wide receiver Shane Williams Rhodes on my podcast called Jay Sports Bar, and we discussed the topic. One other thing that I wanted to ask you is the lack of a senior or an upperclassman in that quarterback room. Because I do think that that is something that we can overlook, and I do think that there's a significant impact on that. I think it's going to be hard to achieve in the current climate of college football because if you do have an upperclassman at quarterback, it's going to be very hard to recruit a young and talented quarterback that wants to play early in his career. I think that's just going to be the challenges you face right now with the freedom of the transfer portal. Because even if you do get him here and he's like, I don't want to wait two more years to start, I'm going to hit the transfer portal and go somewhere else and play. Yeah. Um, but you look back and, I mean, you played with Grant Hedrick. He, he became the most accurate passer in the history of, of the Boise State football program. Yes, more accurate than Kellen Moore. Mm -hmm. he, he set the career completion percentage record over Kellen Moore, right? But I bring up Kellen because Grant – got to sit in that quarterback room and just marinate for years watching Kellen Moore do what he did. Kellen Moore had some guy named Bush Hamden that he got to see how it was done, right? Yep. And right now you literally don't have anybody that's older than a sophomore in that quarterback room. Yeah, and that's tough because, like you said, even like Grant, Grant was able to literally go in the game, pull Kellen out, run a few plays and come back out mm -hmm. and then Kellen goes back in. So like he actually got to play with Kellen. He got to learn from him for two years in the in the quarterback room. Uh I mean you go down the list. You had Finley who got to watch Grant and then Brett. Mm -hmm. Right. Got to learn from him. And yeah. There has almost always been just that mm -hmm. older presence. And and whether they have had success on the field or not, I think that it adds value to that quarterback room. And for sure, it, I, I just think it's different at times when you hear stuff from your coach and when you hear from somebody that is similar in age to you that you respect because he has a little more experience than you and can really relate to you, whether it be, fo be in football or in life. Most of football players, just in general, were visual learners. So when you got here, who was that guy for you? The guy that I actually um, – because it was kind of the guy that I was brought to replace his role, mm -hmm. which a lot of people forget about this guy. I don't know how, but Chris Potter, man. Dude, I saw Chris at the game this last week. Yes. He's doing great. He looks great. Yeah, man. Chris Potter was the guy for me who I watched because, you know, I got here. He was the guy, was the, the smaller guy. He did all the quick things. He was the punt, punt returner. returner. Yep. Like, so it was like, okay, Chris is a senior. You're a freshman. You're all these plays that he had. This is where we're gonna eventually fill you in at. So just kind of learn from that guy. So I got to watch someone. I didn't do punt return my first my first year. Chris was the punt returner. Him and Mitch Burrows. So I got to watch those two do it. I got to learn. I even though they had me doing punt return my freshman year, I never got to do it in a game. But in practice, like it was, those two would go, and I was the next one. So basically, Pete was. Uh, you know, getting me ready because uh, <laughs> that is a wild place to be is back there on punt return. But uh, kick return, I got obviously me and Jay just got to do that as freshmen. But I sat behind Potter and I got a few of his plays from him so I could run him. But I think the biggest tip that I took away from Chris was no disrespect to your uh, Potter. Uh, Chris wasn't fast, but 
he was smart and he was quick. Yeah. And so watching him, how he ran his routes. And it was, what he did is he used a lot of tempo because he wasn't super, super fast. Mm -hmm. What he did is he would tempo his routes sometimes to go maybe 75%. And so he's running and you're just trying to stay with him. And then he would just Boom. hit 100 like now. And then he did it at the top of the routes or, you know, halfway through. So now he's gotten you to slow your feet down and then he takes off and now he's created separation from him changing speed and now you have to react. And then you're reacting and now he's changed direction and he was really good at route running. Just a reminder, you can watch Jay Sports Bar every Wednesday at debuts on YouTube as well as KTVB.com and KTVB Plus. Billy Bowens getting ready to go. Check out the new uniform Boise State is wearing. I have to break this down for you. Yes, they've worn the white helmets, the white jerseys, and the white pants before, but you will notice that they have the Bronco script, the old school script on their white helmets. They've never worn this exact getup before, but they are 21 and eight all time when they wear the all white Stormtrooper look. You can see the guys getting on the field ready to go. We're going to have a full injury update for you later on, but as long as we're giving you this live exclusive look here inside Canvas Stadium on the campus of Colorado State, I wanted to point out that number 83 wide receiver Cole Wright is ready to make a return. He's missed a few games due to an injury. It looks like George Halani will take yet another week to recover from whatever he is dealing with. So Ashton Genty will once again be your starting running back this evening and carry the load for the Boise State backfield. Up front, there's a few interesting things going on on the offensive line. Garrett Kern was actually snapping in warmups to backup quarterback Maddox Madsen, while Mason Randolph was taking snaps with Taylor Green. That would suggest that Maddox, uh, that, excuse me, that uh, Mason Randolph could be your starting center tonight. That is certainly something to keep an eye on. Obviously, Eric McAllister will be ready to go. He leads the Mountain West with 596 yards receiving this season. The Broncos starting to dial things in on offense. They're up to 29.7 points per game on the season. They haven't averaged 30 or more points in a game or for a game over an entire season since 2020, Brian Harson's final year at his alma mater. Well, we are getting ready for kickoff here inside Canvas Stadium. 37 minutes to go. This place, one of the nicest venues in the Mountain West Conference. Let's take you on a quick tour of it. Welcome to Canvas Stadium in Fort Collins. It's been six years since the Rams moved into their new home, but it still remains one of the newest and nicest venues in the entire Mountain West Conference. The doors of this place opened in 2017. The price tag on this palace, $210 million. It can comfortably seat 36,500, slightly more than Alberton Stadium, and I am told it will be a near sellout. But it's also worth noting that should the occasion call for it, they can push capacity here north of 41,000. Colorado is obviously known for the great outdoors and the personal touch they put on this place is really cool. There are 58 peaks over 14,000 feet high throughout the state. And as you walk around Canvas Stadium, they acknowledge each and every one of them. In March of 2016, an anonymous booster donated $20 million over 30 years to name the playing surface here, Sunny Lubick Field, after Colorado State's legendary head coach. The monetary figure just about matched what the school was looking for when it came to sponsorship naming rights. I mean, can you imagine somebody back in Boise donating $20 million to name the blue Chris Peterson Field? It's pretty cool. One of the most notable things about this place is the amount of premium seating. There is no better place to watch the game than the New Belgium Porch, which has a bottomless fountain of beer. You can grab your cup and then sip on some suds just feet away from the field. 
finally we arrive in the Markley Hall of Champions, which is actually the first thing you will see when you arrive at Canvas Stadium. They do a great job of honoring all their athletes here, but they pay special tribute to their five consensus All-Americans. Colorado State actually has more of those than all but three group of five programs. That includes SMU, Rice, and Navy, but none of them have added to their total in the 21st century. He's going to be the analyst for this game? That I did not know. He texted me last week and said, hey, I'm going to be doing some games, but he didn't tell me it was going to be this game. Yeah, you guys were shocked. That was news, too. That would be awesome. Weather's getting cold, so he's probably not playing as much golf. Coach has, obviously, a tremendous mind and uh, has an eye for the game and can see things, so that's, that's pretty cool. Coach Cutter uh, has been a, a mentor of mine for a long time. We were in contact a lot, uh, really, over the last three, four years. Um, at one point, thought his son was maybe going to come to Missouri, and so... I do talk to him, you know, once a week, and uh, he's just a, a really, really great resource uh, and somebody who, who I trust a lot. I mean, he'll shoot some text messages and pop in when he is uh, here in Boise. Uh, so it's, uh, it's good to see him. I'm glad he's keeping busy. He's an extremely hard worker and he's got a, a tremendous mind, so it's not shocking that, you know, for him to continue to be a part of the game. So one year after calling plays for Boise State, Dirk Cutter will now start calling games for FS1. The reaction you saw from both Andy Avalos and offensive coordinator Bush Hamden were completely genuine earlier this week. We all found out together at the weekly Monday press conference. Now, I, managed, I messaged Dirk a little earlier this week and asked him about it. He said he tried out for this role over the summer, and they finally gave him a call back, so he'll make his FS1 debut tonight. As far as a pregame interview goes, he said he preferred just to keep the storylines about the players on the field. A heck of a comment by the analyst. That's a good, always a good thing, right? Speaking of the guys on the field, let's check it out right now. The guys continuing to warm up as we brace for kickoff between Boise State and Colorado State. 33 minutes to go. An updated look at the Mountain West Conference standings. Right now, Boise State trying to keep pace with a couple of other conference unbeatens. Air Force has yet to lose a league game. The same goes for UNLV, Wyoming as well. Wyoming and Air Force are currently doing battle with Air Force holding a slight edge on the Cowboys as we speak. So if Boise State wins tonight, they maintain a perfect 3-0 record in Mountain West Conference play, and they would win their 11th straight Mountain West regular season game. That is one of the longest active conference winning streaks in the regular season in the entire country. Let's flash back to last week's thriller with San Jose State, where Boise State mounted one of their biggest comebacks in the FBS era. This will be one of the most interesting games we have seen on the blue in a long, long time. Boise State is welcoming San Jose State to town, a program that the Broncos have typically dominated. But the Spartans have a good quarterback, they have a great head coach, and they have the playmakers at wide out that just make you uneasy enough to realize this could be a tough game. How do the Broncos respond from all this adversity that they have faced? and move forward against the Spartans. And this is Genty. And Genty, who is a tackle breaker inside the 35. Ball came out late. That is a San Jose State ball and a turnover. Robinson, touchdown Spartans. Off the turnover, Shevin Cordero goes to work and the Spartans take an early lead. First and 10. Cordero breaks a tackle, still moving. Inside the five and inside the end zone. How strong is this cat? Shevin Cordero. Ball coming from the 17. They need to get to the 28. So it's third and 11. Madsen, right side. McAllister with a catch. Defender falls down. McAllister sprinting down the right sideline. Tacklers chasing. They will not get to him. A touchdown. 83 yards to Eric McAllister from Maddox Matson, and the Broncos are on the board. Genty lost the ball. It's loose. And San Jose State has their third turnover. 
Argenti's second fumble. Parham, who cried the first one loose, has the second one. Left side. This is Conley, and he's in. Touchdown, Spartans. Goodness. Edson gets the snap. Over the middle, complete to McAllister at the 25. Inside the 20, he'll get down to the 19. Madsen quarterback draw, five, and he's into the end zone. Maddox Madsen twice calls his own number on quarterback draws, and he's into the end zone with 42 seconds left. It's 27 to 13. Genty out of the backfield in motion to the right. Green sets up a quarterback draw, runs in the middle, dodges tacklers. He scores, and this game is tied at 27 on the 11-yard scamper from Taylor Green. Green under center. Green with the ball, throws it out right flat. Caught Riley Smith. The captain is into the end zone for the touchdown, and Boise State leads it 34-27. Broncos by eight, 35-27. Cordero in the pocket, good protection, throws it, it's intercepted. McCoy with the pick at the San Jose 42-yard line. That's Boise State's first first, first turnover of the game. San Jose State has to convert a fourth and 10 at the 37. Blitz again, Cordero. Scampers away, almost sacked, comes to the line, and he's going to be tackled. Game, set, match. Boise State on the sack. Sports.com Can't tell Bronco Nation how much they were a part of that comeback. Yeah, that stadium was electric. We're 2-0 in conference play. Really cool experience to be a part of that comeback tonight and to see the players lead themselves into that, to see the coaches will the players back into that tonight. That's who this team is capable of being, and we're excited to build off of that as we move forward. Boise State's second half effort on defense was truly remarkable, and I would even say unbelievable last week, especially considering the way a lot of the way the season has gone. They've given up big plays and too many points way too often. But if you look at San Jose State quarterback Chevin Cordero last week, in the first half, he was 11 of 16 for 242 yards. He averaged 15.1 yards per pass attempt. That's an explosive play every time he put the ball in the air on average. In the second half, just 12 for 22 for 83 yards, an average of just 3.7 yards per attempt. You can see the herd running by our cameraman, John Mark Crum right there. You also saw number 21, Amarion McCoy just moments ago. He was one of the young guys that really stepped up last week and made a big play. And because of it, tonight we feature him on our roadmap to victory. Bronco Roundup's Roadmap to Victory is sponsored by Treasure Valley Ford Stores. I just try to be joyful with everybody and just, that's just, what, this is the type of person I am. Uh, he's a funny dude. I mean, he's hilarious, you know, uh, and he's just fun to be around. where I came from. Um, just trying to always have a positive mindset and things like that. Things in my life wasn't too too great for me and me being able to go to JUCO and get out of JUCO and come here and being blessed to be able to do that is just, just always puts a smile on my face. I always remember that. We're hoping that we continue to progress with that. He's very capable. You're 100% right. Um, there is a lot more that's expected at this level than the junior college level. Um, there's a lot more resources and time and things that we can use to our benefit. Uh, it's, it's way different. Um, just being in JUCO is just a different ball game from being here at a Division One level. Being in JUCO, you get more freedom and time to slack off and things like that. But now this is a bigger emphasis on things. A blue collar, like we, we just got to work hard. I like that. That's that's the reason why I came here. Broncos by eight. We always meet um, throughout the week, corner room as a as a defense, as a back end, and 
we just go over things and take notes. And their two minute situation, they were looking to go to the hash. So he had a quick read to the left and then come right back. Throws it, it's intercepted. McCoy with the pick. Threw it a little inside and I was on top of it. So I was able to jump it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody is celebrating. You know, that's a huge moment for him. You know, we love the dude. He just came in and to see him make a big play like that, like, you know, that's what everybody dreams, for, dreams about. And we all celebrated with him. We made sure that he knew that we were proud of him. Here's another live look at the field at Canvas Stadium. The Broncos warming up, getting ready to go through uh, their final stages of their pregame warm up. A couple of notable things. So Mason Randolph is going to start tonight for the Broncos at center. He is currently operating with the number one offense in the final stages of the walkthrough. And number 66, Ben Dooley, is going to make his return to the lineup after missing the previous few games. He is going to get the start at left guard next to Cade Bears, or excuse me, Cage Casey at left tackle. Cade Bearsford is going to be your starting right guard or right tackle and Roger Carrion will be your starting right guard. The right side of that offensive line has really been healthy all season long and really reliable. You see Shea Oladipo right there. A couple of the defensive backs getting ready to go for tonight's action. Boise State will be shorthanded at the wide receiver position. Chase Penry still dealing with an injury he suffered against North Dakota almost a month ago. Starting linebacker DJ Schramm has also been ruled out, along with starting edge Dimitri Washington. Last week when Dimitri went down, they had a mixture of Jaden Virgin and Andrew Simpson filling in for him. We'll see how the Broncos navigate that tonight against Colorado State. Fort Collins, one of the coolest towns in the Mountain West, and earlier this week, we took a tour around it. When you come to Fort Collins, a trip to sip at New Belgium Brewing is a must. Here's why it is the most popular brewery in town. The story begins in 1988. The company's co-founder, Jeff Lebisch, took a bike ride through Belgium. He pedaled and poured his way through the countryside, sampling a variety of local ales. Lebisch was an avid at-home brewer. So when he returned home, he attempted to replicate the aromas and flavors. Three years later, New Belgium Brewing was born. This is a 100% employee-owned company, and it's been named one of the best places to work by Outsider Magazine 10 years running. And guess what? For employees to hit the five-year mark here, they get a free trip to, you guessed it, Belgium. Just down the way is another locally famous House of Hops, the Odell Brewing Company. Born right here in Fort Collins, years ago, passion poured out in the most perfect way. While honeymooning in the UK in 1985, Doug and Winnie Odell were inspired by a small number of breweries they visited. Four years later, they made the decision to move to Fort Collins and take on a new craft. Ever since the day they opened, Good stuff. <laughs> They've taken great pride in experimenting with hops, unique ingredients, exploring new flavors, and being 100% employee owned. From beers to a blast from the past, how about a slice of fun? Fort Collins proudly claims to have the only 1980s only museum in the entire world. Stalin Fort Collins. Totally 80s pizza is a museum field with unique memorabilia. From the moment you walk in the door, you are slapped in the face with nostalgia and the smell of pizza, of course. From Chuck Norris to the king of pop, Slimer is a great reminder of my childhood, as are the vintage video games, cereal boxes, toys, and best of all, the music. This is a visual vortex of vintage fun that took owner Alex Morgan over 10 years to collect. The reason why he wanted to do it is so that the younger generation could have a place that they could appreciate the greatness of the 80s. May the force be with you, Alex. Boise State will go for it. Madsen over the middle. Ball caught by Crow. Crow fighting for the first down. I think he got it. 
Second effort by Tyler Crow moves the sticks and gets the first down. And that was all effort by Tyler Crow to get the first down. Huge play. Fourth and six. It's a critical, critical point in the game going into halftime to, to cut that lead down. You know, to get to 14 prior to and then come out and know, OK, we get a stop when we come out. This thing could change really quick. He had a really explosive physical play on our sideline, you know, receiving the ball out of the backfield. That's who T. Crow is. He jumps back in, he gets healthy. He wants to be on the special teams. He jumps in there and he goes. Um, there was a point in the game, too, uh, when we had a conversation. And I was like, we're going to do this. And we need you. We need you to make, help us lead into it. And he did a great job, not only on the field, but on the sideline, too. And he brought that spark. And we all know when he gets in the game, he's going to do anything and everything he can, you know, to have an impact on the game. Tyler Crow never lacks energy. I actually witnessed Andy Avalos uh, pull him aside on the sideline last week with Boise State trailing 27-7, needing a spark. The cheerleaders were bringing it, Buster was bringing it, and so was Tyler Crow. Moments later, Avalos called on Tyler Crow to convert a crucial fourth down. With Boise State down 20, they went for it on fourth and six at their own 44. Maddox Matson hit Tyler Crow for a check down. He got the first down. Maddox later scored, and that was the play that truly sparked the comeback for Boise State last week. You know, being here in the Centennial State, it's kind of a homecoming for a number of Broncos, like uh, junior Nickel Shea Oladipo, as well as sophomore running back kick return specialist Caden Dudley. Both of them grew up here in Colorado. Over the last season and a half, Dudley has made a name for himself as one of the more explosive kick returners in the entire Mountain West Conference, and he can't wait to show out in front of family and friends tonight. No, it's always special. Uh... In Colorado, the air smells different, you know, so I think it's just the little things like that. Just once you're there, you know, you know your home, you get the, the sense of home, you get the feeling of home and things like that. So last year, the Air Force game, I think I had like 30 people from my family that were able to come out. So it's definitely uh, it's a good experience. It's definitely always fun going back home. Both Caden and Shea expecting over a dozen family members, over two dozen family members each tonight. So I'm sure that you will hear their families cheering uh, in the crowd tonight. In the meantime, Brady, they are expecting a near sellout crowd tonight. The fans starting to fill up, the energy starting to pick up as we get closer and closer to kickoff here in Fort Collins. Well, that's good to see. I'm glad it will be a change of pace from the last Mountain West road trip to San Diego State. I'll tell you what, the fans in the stands, they're going to see a premier matchup on special teams. Two of the best punters you'll find in the Mountain West, BSU's James Ferguson Reynolds and Colorado State's Patty Turner. The pair are both part of a trend that we've seen take over college football in the last decade. Both teams join, the, both players join their teams coming by way of Australia. They even train together in the offseason back home. I caught up with James earlier this week to learn more about his journey out to the United States and how well he's adjusted to playing American football. Yeah, no, I never heard of Boise. I actually got a call that morning at like 6 a.m. from my coach and, you know, he said, uh, Boise wants to have a chat, be on the phone in a couple of hours. Didn't even know how to spell it or look it up. So it was a funny story and, uh, yeah, loved it here. You know, Boise matches back home. Um, country kid myself, so amazing spot. Fell in love with it straight away. From Geelong, Australia, over 8,000 miles to Boise State. James Ferguson Reynolds is part of a new trend in American football. Growing up, I played Aussie rules football, and uh, you know the dream didn't really carry out too much. I wanted to get drafted and play there, but um, you know that fell through. So he decided to follow in the footsteps of Michael Dixon. The Australian punter is somewhat of a national treasure after climbing the ranks to the NFL. Yeah, big time. Yeah, he's uh, all over the news back home. So obviously been very successful at Texas and uh, and at Seattle. So. Ferguson Reynolds enrolled at Pro Kick Australia, a punting academy that has sent 190 scholarship athletes to play in the U.S., helping make the transition from Aussie rules to the NCAA as seamless as possible. The first time I put a helmet on was, uh, was a bit of a shock. I was like, oh, geez, what, what's going on? It's very heavy, and uh, yeah, it was a weird transition. It took me, took me a little bit to learn, but yeah, I used to it now. He's one of three Aussie-born punters in the Mountain West, along with tonight's matchup, Patty Turner of the Colorado State Rams. I saw the punter go out there, kick it, and then run off, and I was like, that looks like a pretty good gig, so 
The duo even trained together in the offseason. He's a very good punter and a, a very good, very good player. Um, I'm excited to see what he does and how his game evolves. He's got a lot of different punts in his back pocket, so I'm excited to see how he uses them and, and utilizes them towards the Broncos. But as long as they're not against the Rams, we'll be good. Yeah, it's really fun. Um, you know, we, we all train together back home, so we're all pretty close and, and coaching each other up, so it's fun. And then we come over here and it's competition time. So during this week, it's pretty quiet. You know, we'll, we'll chat a little bit pre-game, but uh, yeah, just uh, leave it all out there and then we'll, we'll catch up after the game. In just his second season in the States, Ferguson Reynolds has excelled. He currently leads the nation in yards per punt and last week booted a 71 yarder tied for the fourth longest in the FBS this year. James has grown a ton since he's been here. It's not easy to move from another country and come here. It's pretty fun to see week in and week out the different things that uh, James is able to do. We just want to continue to see him grow and find ways to, you know, that he could change the game. And with a following halfway around the world, that's what he's been doing. The support's been awesome, all from family, and, and now that I guess my name is starting to get out there and Boise State's becoming a, a big thing back home now, we've got a big crowd back home, which is awesome. Some Boise State fans back home in Australia, so yeah, it's, it's amazing, the support coming from back home. And of course, it's a big day for the Australian native. James Ferguson Reynolds will be leading the Broncos out onto the field carrying the hammer. He's the first kicker or punter to do that for Boise State, as far as we know. And it's funny, usually that's given to a guy who makes a big hit on special teams. Well, obviously, James Ferguson Reynolds has been hitting the ball pretty hard on special teams, putting up some of the best stats in the country. We got more coming up after this. For now, let's give you a look at how the Broncos did this week in practice. Bronco Roundup Game Day. Keys to the game, sponsored by Dollar Loan Center. Don'tBeBroke.com. He is a problem. He is a huge, huge problem. Been that way for a few years now. He's pretty consistent on the edge, very explosive player. I like him as a player. He knows exactly who he is, and he tries to thrive in that role, and he tries to be the best he can be at his skill set. He's a guy that you got to be aware of. He leads the nation in sacks. He, uh, he's also caused a few fumbles, so he's, he's proven to be a uh, very, very productive player, whether it's in the run game or obviously creating pressure on the quarterback. We knew he was a problem last year, um, and he's even gotten better this offseason, so we have every single thing you can possibly do to help kind of mitigate his impact in the game. That's our job as coaches, is not let him ruin the game, so we've done we've done our darndest to um, stay up late at night to make sure to make sure that he's, he's not getting his name called very much. All right, let's jump into our keys to the game before we go. I think the Boise State coaching staff put it best right there. Mohamed Kamara on the CSU D line is going to be a problem. He leads the nation in sacks, and he's going to give the offensive line for the Broncos quite a challenge, especially since it's a group that has been moving around their positions quite a bit, although they have been extremely consistent up to this point. We're going to see if they can keep it going. Jumping over to a key to the game on offense. I think the big story throughout this week has been Boise State managing their two quarterback system the big challenge that I think Boise State has had the entire year getting out to a rhythm a little bit earlier they found they had some great showings last year uh, specifically last week in the second half of the San Jose State game they fueled an awesome comeback it'd be great to see the Broncos get off to a much faster start come start working with a lead instead of trying to complete another comeback I'll tell you what as we get up to game time that's going to be all for our show tonight we want to remind you to follow along with the game on our KTVB.com website and of course afterwards we're going to have the post game press conference with Andy Avalos and the select student athletes airing live on our YouTube channel of course we'll be back to tell you everything that happens tomorrow on the news at 5 and Sunday Sports Extra for now thank you for watching we'll see you after